so um, uh, I want to continue on this idea of Syriac spirituality. Uh, I don't recall exactly what I covered last time. It's been so long. And uh, I uh, also, uh, this past week, uh, I was invited and I, I preached the uh, retreat for the clergy of the other eparchy on the theme of Syriac spirituality. Uh, so I gave six, six uh, talks there, and so uh, I'm trying in my own mind to decide what I covered here and what I didn't cover. Uh, but I'm going to review a few things anyway. So first of all, uh, one of the constant themes that I've been talking about in the previous lectures uh, that I think is very important uh, for the Syriac world, and therefore uh, hopefully the Maronite world, uh, is this whole emphasis that the Syriac writers had on the fact that human beings are in the image and likeness of God. And that they really took that seriously. And as we've said throughout the last several lectures, they not only saw us in the image and likeness of God, uh, but since God, from the Syriac view, uh, planned Christ to become human, or the word to become human, uh, from the moment of creation, not just at the start of original sin, but from the very moment he wanted to create. In other words, if we can put it a different way, if Adam had not sinned, the incarnation would have taken place. Uh, I think the Franciscans had that a long time ago in the Middle Ages, uh, but the rest of the church uh, seemed to think that uh, uh, it's the sin of Adam that triggered Plan B. Uh, but uh, really, uh, if you look at the scriptures and you look at John's Gospel, the, the first chapter of John, the Word was there at the beginning, and the Word became flesh. So if we're in the image and likeness of the Word of God become flesh, then we ourselves uh, have a spark of God within us uh, from the moment that we were conceived. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, we are in some ways more than just human. Of course, you know, in Psalm 8, it says about God, you made man a little, little less than the angels. So if we're more than just human, that means there's a divine part to us. And uh, the Syriac writers focus on that all the time, that uh, from the moment we were conceived as human beings, God already is present within us. Uh, in, by the very fact of what our humanity is. Now, what that means is then that when we are baptized, that God that's in us becomes, takes birth. So think about conception and birth. Uh, when we're baptized, uh, or you know, when a fetus becomes a child, uh, then you begin to grow. And so, for them, baptism was a central idea of spirituality. And uh, the idea then is, how do we now, uh, that we are, are human beings and we've been baptized, how do we proceed on the level of, of being a, a spiritual person? And one way I've put it in many of the talks I've given is that what we're called in spirituality is to grow up. How do we become mature uh, human beings uh, intended for what God uh, wanted us to be? And so the whole idea of spirituality is how do we grow up from our baptism? And I think I've mentioned this a couple times in some other talks. There's a lot of people today who are Catholic and will die for, for the Catholic faith. You know, take me, take me. Uh, but they're still infants when it comes to what it is to be a full human being. Uh, in fact, one of the writers I focus on a lot is this person named John the Solitary of Apamea. That's a full title. Uh, for him, he takes St. Paul, and where St. Paul says, how do you become the uh, full stature of a human being? And that's what spirituality is supposed to be. So the... Uh, we have to keep this in mind uh, that when we have even like, look at some of these quotes, the spiritual writers believe that our goal 
to be the mature human being, which doesn't, is not completed until we are resurrected uh, humans in heaven, uh, that the, it's already there within us. But we have to find it. We have to discover it. And so that's, that's the whole idea of the spiritual life. How do we, as human beings, go deep enough into ourselves in order to find the God that is already there? And uh, so the last couple talks I gave was uh, how do we get to that point? And uh, uh, we talked about the fact that uh, we have a body, we have a soul, and they talked about having a spirit. And the spirit is that part of the soul that is the deepest within us and the closest to God himself. So that when we have a, uh, or people have a mystical experience, what that means is they're somehow interfacing with the divine. And uh, that happens within the depths of our soul. The problem we have, as we talked about the last time I gave a lecture here, is our bodies have, a, if I can use a mixed metaphor, have a mind of their own. Our bodies, our senses, uh, they're, they, first of all, you need to eat, you need to drink uh, to, le to live, uh, and you need to interact with people through your senses. So our senses tend to go astray. And so the, the real challenge, first of all, in the spiritual life is how do we keep our body in harmony with our soul? And that's a lifelong uh, challenge. And uh, that's why, you know, as we, we said before, that's why we have the Lenten fast. And that's why in the old days, in, the, in Lebanon, you had the 20-day fast before Christmas, which began right after the Feast of St. Barbara. That's why we have a big feast. It's almost like a Mardi Gras before Christmas. Uh, but we also had a 10-day fast before the Feast of Peter and Paul and another 10-day fast before the uh, Dormition of Mary, the Assumption. So there was a lot of fasting that went on in Lebanon. Uh, we don't do that here now, except if you really uh, still brought your Lebanese custom with you. Uh, but the whole idea of fasting is not just to uh, uh, you know, prove that uh, you're trying to be holy, but how do you discipline your body so that it doesn't drag you off in the wrong directions? Uh, but then, the next part of the spiritual life is your soul. And for people like, again, John the Solitary, the soul, the, the soul, without talking about the spirit at the moment, the soul wants to know. It wants to understand. It wants to use its intellect. And so here again, there's an issue, and that is that you could be so interested in so many things and argue about a lot of things and become the greatest philosopher in the world and, and you know, be respected as a great thinker, but you've crowded your soul with so many things that you don't look beyond. And so the, the problem with the soul is how do you clear the soul from its inclinations to keep talking, keep asking questions, keep researching. It's good to have knowledge. I mean. I thought when I was a younger person that I, my goal in life was to be a renaissance man. Uh, I'm not quite there, but I do like a lot of things. Uh, but the problem is, do you crowd out the spirit? And so that's why part of, uh, you know, when we, uh, people who uh, left the, the world and went out into the desert and so forth, uh, part of that was not only to deal with the body, but with the soul. Uh, because uh, once you're in the world, once you have a family, uh, there's a lot of distractions. And uh, once you're in, in public society, there's a lot of things that go on. And now it's gotten worse, right? Uh, now social media, to me, I'm glad that I'm not on social media. You can hardly find me unless you just Google me and they'll tell you about some of my writings. But I'm not on Facebook. I don't have a family, so I don't have to be on Facebook. Uh, and I don't, you know, I go to alumni reunions and so forth, but I don't need to know what everybody else is doing. And I'm not sure I want them to know what I'm doing. Uh, so, uh, but uh, there's so many things going on now. Uh, and of course, the famous cell phone, where you're always on your cell phone, even when you're eating, and sometimes when you're sleeping, I think. 
and uh, and so uh, so how do you uh, discipline the soul? And so that was a, a, a very a large part of of how we try to get to our spirit. And our spirit is that part of our soul that seeks the higher things uh, and uh, seeks to, uh, to get to, uh, uh, you know, to get to the God who dwells within us. And so this is what we've been trying to do in the last uh, three talks, I guess. Now I also, that's where I'm not sure how much I covered last time, uh, I also talked about prayer. Now, uh, there's all kinds of prayer. First of all, there is communal prayer, what we just did at the, in the church. We come together to pray publicly, uh, to pray with each other, uh, to express ourselves publicly by chanting and so forth. Uh, and, and this is the prayer of the whole community reaching out towards God. And the priest here is the interlocutor between the community and God, uh, praying at the altar. And so uh, this is what we do in, in communal prayer. But there's also that other kind of prayer that we talked about last time, uh, where we have private prayer, internal prayer, uh, prayer that we pray ourselves between us and God. And uh, the Syriac writers focus a lot on that kind of prayer. Uh, and one of the themes I, I'm sure I mentioned last time, if I didn't mention this, please correct me. You follow everything I was doing. Uh, the, uh, the, the theme that some of the writers developed was the idea that personal prayer, public prayer in a way, is replaces the sacrifices of the Old Testament. And so the idea here is that just as in the Old Testament, uh, people offered sacrifices, at the temple, uh, be either because they've sinned or in gratitude, or uh, you know, uh, when you're born, when a child is born, and so forth. Uh, the idea here of sacrifice is again reaching out to God, and God reaches out and accepts your sacrifice. So, for them, prayer in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, is our kind of sacrifice. We don't sacrifice our animals. We sacrifice our thoughts and our love. We present them to God. And that's what happens in, in personal prayer. Uh, but then they, they warn us that in the Old Testament, you wouldn't dare offer uh, a lamb that is a sickly lamb to God. Because uh, if you're doing that, you're faking it. You know, you're, uh, you're not really serious. Uh, you're insulting God. And so they point out that if we are offering our prayer, then that prayer should be with a pure heart. Because God, you know, uh, welcomed the sacrifice of Abel, but not of Cain. Because his heart was not pure. Uh, and so to offer prayer, we also now have to do what? We have to remove from our hearts any kind of anger, any kind of uh, dislike of someone, any kind of selfishness, uh, any kind of other things that can hurt people by gossip or whatever. And so the whole idea here, if, if your prayer is going to be a real touching with God, it has to be done with a pure heart. And so this is a really essential to the idea of prayer. Now, they also developed an imagery about what happens here in private prayer. And the image they use, uh, they use a couple images. One, for example, St. Ephraim uh, says that the soul is the bridal chamber. Because in baptism, uh, we, uh, we become temples of God, temples of Christ. And so the soul is the bridal chamber and Christ is the bride, uh, as the groom. And so that's one image they use. So that again, the whole idea of a purity of heart. Uh, another image that was used a lot is that the heart is the altar. And your prayer is the sacrifice. 
And you, offering prayer, are a priest, like the priesthood from baptism. So you offer the prayer on the altar of your heart, and God sends down the Spirit on your prayer and makes it acceptable. And so they developed that idea of what prayer really is, uh, this communion with God. And uh, so, as I, I know I mentioned this last time, uh, there are, as you read in the catechism, there are four kinds of prayer we always talk about. Adoration, thanksgiving, uh, penance, and petition. Most of the time we focus on petition. <laughs> I pray to God so I'll get that job or whatever. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, but prayer, first of all, is, is adoration. But I think I mentioned this before. Adoration not in the sense that you're adoring uh, a super emperor, but adoration in the sense that uh, a husband and wife turn to each other and say, I adore you. Uh, maybe they are an emperor, I don't know. But uh, <laughs> yeah. but the idea here is that that I, I cherish you. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I appreciate your presence. Uh, so adoration, thanksgiving, gratitude, uh, a lot of people miss out on gratitude, uh, but your gratitude to God is by the very fact, look at my age, that I can get up in the morning and I can kick around and I'm doing okay. Uh, praise the Lord. Uh, the uh, <coughs> repentance, penance, we're all sinners. We understand our weaknesses, but we also understand mercy and forgiveness in the presence of God. And then finally, petition. But petition, the Syriac fathers are interesting. They say if you really believe in God's providence, then you really don't have to pray for what you need. He already knows. Mm -hmm. So petition here, I, uh, my interpretation of petition is where you are uh, reaffirming what's going on. So you're saying to God, like, uh, again, uh, looking to... Uh, uh, your lover and saying, you know, we should do something about this. What do you think? Uh, and so, uh, so petition should not even be transactional. Uh, by that I mean, I know I mention this every time I talk about this. Uh, some people treat God that I'll do something for you if you do something for me. And if you don't do something for me, I'm going to get angry. <laughs> and uh, we, we, I, I know people who stop coming to church. Uh, or even stop believing because, hey, I pray to God, and maybe it was a very serious thing in their life, a sick child, whatever. And because it didn't, the prayer was not uh, responded in that way, uh, they say, well, look, I don't need God. But see, what have you said there? I don't need God. Is that your friendship with God from the beginning was based on what I need and don't need? Uh, the, uh, one of my favorite quotes, but I won't do it again, uh, to me, my, my basic relationship with God is friendship. And you don't say, I, uh, you're my friend as long as I need you. And if you don't do something about it, I don't need you anymore. And so, uh, so prayer in that context is really wanting to be in the presence of God and wanting to commune with God. Now, I don't know if I mentioned this last time, but I think it's a good way to summarize. Uh, what I'm talking about here. Uh, early on, even back at the time of uh, Ephraim to some degree, but certainly when you get to a, a, a work called the Book of Steps, which is a Syriac book uh, written near the end of the 400s, uh, the Book of Steps talks about three churches or three altars. And they say that this is what the spiritual life is all about. The first altar is the church community, the public church. And at that first altar, as we said, people gather together as a community to pray to God together. And part of the reason of gathering together as a community is to upbuild each other, support each other. That's the idea of, of church. I know Monsignor Sibley's been talking about that for a while. Uh, that you, uh, uh, 
the whole idea of gathering together and receiving the Eucharist is community. Uh, I think I mentioned this before. It's great in, in, in English. We say, I'm, I'm going to make my first Holy Communion. Communion. You don't say, I'm going to make my first Holy Eucharist, although the Eucharist means Thanksgiving. Communion. The whole point of receiving the Eucharist is not just a union with God, but a union with everybody else in the congregation. So the whole idea of the Eucharist is how do how is the power of the presence of Christ able to take all of our differences, all of our distinctiveness, and, and mold us into a, a single body. And so that's the whole idea of communion, that the, the community of uh, Maronites in the Washington, D.C. area is a community that is becoming more and more in union with each other. Uh, th that's the whole idea. So you have the church of, uh, of, you know, the public church. Secondly, you have the interior church, the church of your personal prayer life. And in the interior church, as we said, there is a different liturgy going on. And that liturgy is your prayer and the purity of your heart. Uh, and, uh, you know, those moments where you and God are in communion. But again, as we said a moment ago, you have to have a pure heart, which means is that you love everybody else. Now, you know, there's, this, is, uh, this is binary. Either you love someone or you dismiss someone. There is no middle ground. Uh, you know, uh, so, uh, yeah, you might have people you don't like and people who you consider enemies and people who hate your guts. But as a human being, your only option is to love. Uh, if you don't believe me, read John's epistles. Uh, you know, he runs out of how many times he says about God is love, and you're called to love. But how can you love God when you say you don't see when you don't love your brother whom you do see? Uh, so, uh, so that's the interior church. And then there is the heavenly church. Uh, the heavenly church is where, to use the imagery of the book of Revelation, is where you have a constant <coughs> divine liturgy. And we see that in our own celebration of the liturgy here, when at the uh, prayer of praise, after the prayer of praise, we chant, holy, 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 Lord God of hosts. And so in that moment, our earthly choir, as good as they are, are joining the heavenly choir. And so we have a joint choir and a joint celebration of the Eucharist. Now, but what they also mean by that is that if you, you and I, if we proceed in our prayer life, purifying it, gaining more and more love of, and, and appreciation of, of the Lord, that once in a while, perhaps, you'll reach that point in your spirit where you get intimations, glimpses, of the heavenly church. And so uh, it only happens rarely, perhaps, but you, you experience something of that joy, of that openness, uh, uh, of that intimacy with God, yeah, the Syriac writers even talk about you kind of you're, you're on fire. You feel the power of the Spirit. Uh, so you have that third church, which is what we aim for, and which we will arrive at once we uh, reach heaven itself. So this is how they they look at uh, the idea of prayer and the spiritual life. Now there's a lot of other things that they talk about, but I'm not going to go into. A lot of detail, but I just want to give you some idea of how they're looking upon the spiritual life. For example, uh, once you're on this second level of the soul, uh, then this is where uh, what Evagrius, the Greek writer, uh, focused a lot of time on, uh, but the idea of contemplation. 
And I'm sure if you picked up spiritual books, they try to help you uh, with contemplation. Again, the theory behind this is that the Holy Spirit, who resides in you, resides in you no matter what you do, unless you deny the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit uh, is able to enlighten you if you are in, in, uh, in a moment of, uh, 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 where you've removed your thoughts and desires to, uh, to look at the world that God has created. To look at that world and to see the hand of God in everything that God has created. Uh, and so alongside of contemplation, they talk about uh, divine providence. Uh, the whole idea here, and I think it's very important, is that uh, the, the Syriac writers, and even St. Thomas Aquinas has a whole section of the Summa Theologica on divine providence. Uh, the whole idea here is that if you really believe that everything comes from God, everything relies on God, then you can, with your own eyes, so to speak, uh, with your own mind, see the hand of God in everything that goes on. And uh, the more you can see that, uh, the more you understand how God is. And so there's an attempt to arrive at a certain wisdom, a spiritual wisdom. And this is what happens with, with contemplation. Now, very important in that is meditating on the scriptures. Why is that so? Well, from our point of view as believers, the scriptures was God's best shot at tell, uh, telling us what he's about. You want to get to know God, uh, you can get, get to know some of God by looking at nature, the beauty of things, but if you really want to get to know a, a, a little more about God, Read the scriptures, because from our faith, we say the scriptures are how God has been able to interact with human beings. Now, as I mentioned, I think once or twice before, uh, when God becomes word, written word, spoken word, a lot is lost in translation. God can give us himself. What God does is he gives us the best he can do. Uh, and the words, uh, you know, uh, that, that we use. Because they're human words. They're finite words. They're finite images, symbols, stories. Uh, and so in the story, you'll find uh, something there. It's like, let's say uh, you went to, uh, I remember when I first went with my mother, we stopped, uh, we went to Lebanon, we stopped in uh, Istanbul. And it was the first time that I landed in a country where I, I couldn't figure out the language. I mean, in, in, in European countries, you know, I, I know a lot of French, I know uh, Latin and so forth. You can pretty well follow what's going on. When I got there, I couldn't even read the bus signs, you know. How do you make yourself known to somebody who doesn't speak your language? You try as much as you can to come up with ideas broken words, whatever, to make yourself known. And let's say you have a friend who's a, a good friend of yours, but right now you're only communicating almost by signs. Well, a lot gets lost in translation. Now, imagine God for a moment. God is what God is. He wants to tell us about himself. So what does he do? He uses human words. He uses human culture. The, the Old Testament is Jewish. You can't get around that. It's not Anglo-Saxon. Uh, it's not American Indian. Except for, you know, Joseph Smith and all that. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but, uh, so God decided, you know, to become a Jew. And one British writer once said, how odd of God to choose the Jews. Uh, <laughs> So, so right away, you have a cultural condition. You have a historical condition. You have the limitation of words. Uh, and so the scriptures have to be approached for how, what they can tell us about God, but what they can't tell us about.
Now, the reason I've gone into this whole thing is I'm always frightened by people who grab the scriptures and take a verse and try to prove something. Because as I've said often, remember, when Jesus was being tempted, the devil quoted scripture to Jesus. So the devil can quote scripture. Uh, but what these writers are telling us, if you want to know God's plan, take the stories of scripture and find the meaning within that, that uh, story. Find, as, uh, as well as you can be guided, what the scripture is reading, really telling you and me about life about our relationship with God and other people and nature and so forth. Uh, that's the main idea. I mean, you can sit there and argue whether Jesus uh, had a public life of three years or one year, or whether Jesus, when he started preaching, was 30 years old or 40 years old. Why 40? Because uh, at one place they said, you're not even 50. Uh, so if you're not even 50, I guess they were saying you're 40. But anyway, you can argue all that stuff all you want. Uh, and whether Jesus, you know... Uh, uh, you know, uh, or whether St. Paul approves slavery and so forth. Uh, but that's not what the scriptures are about. The scriptures are our attempt to take what God is able to give us and for us to find what God's purposes are in the scriptural presentation. But this can help us to get to know God in our contemplation. So that, that is the, 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 the whole idea of, of contemplation, scripture, divine providence. Now, there are certain things that the Syriac writers uh, encourage us to achieve uh, in the spiritual life. And I'm only going to mention a, a couple of uh, uh, themes or virtues. One is simplicity. Simplicity. Uh, the Syriac word is uh, to be one singleness oneness and the idea here is that uh, by simplicity and by this word in Syriac they meant three different things first of all that you're single in your focus whether you're married or or, or, or unmarried, whether you're a hermit or not, uh, whatever is going on in, uh, uh, you know, in your attachments, you are also called to be single. By that we mean that you are who you are. Whether you're a, a, a father of three or four or five children or whatever, uh, whether you're in a complicated uh, uh, you know, uh, s s civil life, but you have to be yourself. You have to be able to, uh, to understand how you are to uh, you know, handle all your responsibilities as a parent, for example, but also how you ought to handle those times when you have to be connected with God. Now that's why for them, of course, the easy way is leave everything and go become a hermit. Um, or join a religious community. I don't know if that's going to solve anything. Uh, but uh, the, uh, the point is that we're called to have this single area of our own selves. Secondly, single-mindedness. So you can't be a divided person. Uh, and the scriptures tell us that. Uh, you have to be completely of one mind, uh, of one heart, and how you are approaching your life. And thirdly, uh, you have to achieve a uh, relationship, a union with the single one. And who's the single one? Jesus, the only begotten. Uh, so in, in, in Syriac, when they said the Ihidaya, they were referring to Christ, the only begotten uh, of the Father. And so, uh, you have to put on the mind of Christ. And so uh, this is a very essential part uh, of the uh, spiritual life. Another author points out that when you're called to be simple, it doesn't mean you're called to be a simpleton. You're not called to be a dummy or a fool. Uh, but his warning is 
you're not, you're not being simple if you question everything. Uh, he said when Christ calls his disciples, uh, they didn't set up conditions before they joined him. And so when the Lord is calling you, uh, you don't spend your time arguing back and forth. Uh, of, of, should I do this or not? Again, you have to have the guidance of a spiritual director and so forth to understand what the call is. But you're called to have this simple attitude. Blessed are the meek, for they shall you know, inherit the earth. And thirdly, uh, and this is a hard one again for us living in the modern world, uh, stillness, serenity. You have to be able to reach a point I guess in the modern world, at least for a few moments out of the day, a few moments, uh, where you can try to remove everything else from your mind uh, in order to get that point of stillness where you're able to reach that deep part of your soul. Now I say I know the situation. Some people work two or three jobs. Uh, some people are on the go. Some people. Uh, only have four or five hours of sleep at night because of all the things they have to do. Uh, I understand that. But, you know, if we can get that little time uh, in the corner of our house or out in the backyard or whatever, or even driving in our car without getting into an accident, uh, uh, if we can just have a few moments where we can remove everything, uh, all our worries, all our concerns, uh, whatever concerns we have, I mean, even if you're going to declare war on somebody, uh, you, you, you still can find a few moments. Uh, and so uh, that is uh, another aspect that they, they really uh, recommend, obviously, if you're going to reach that hidden part of yourself. Now, uh, the final point here is the state, what they call the state of perfection. How do you reach the level of perfection? And what does that mean? Well, basically, what it means is that uh, if you've succeeded of disciplining your, your body and your soul, uh, if you've succeeded in, uh, uh, you know, reaching that kind of harmony, uh, in your in your life, then you know there's a great possibility that you can get to a higher level, uh, a higher level where uh, uh, you really, as I said a few moments ago, are getting towards the heavenly level itself. Now, in this regard, uh, there's an interesting uh, essay that John the Solitary wrote about what he called silent prayer. That was something new in, in, in the history of spirituality. We've talked about pure prayer, purity of heart, but he actually talks about silent prayer. And what he means by that is he takes the example of what happened with the Word of God. And he said the Word of God, when he was with God as Word of God, uh, the realm of God is the realm of silence. In fact, I think I mentioned this once before, that they even, the Syriac writers think that in heaven, with that heavenly choir going on, when it gets to holy, 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 uh, they, their holy, 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 their Kaddishat, uh, is in silence. Uh, silence from a human point of view. Uh, in the heavenly point of view, they have their own spiritual sound and spiritual uh, vision. Uh, so. So the word of God comes from silence to speech, to word. The word of God, the, the communication of God, becomes physical word. Jesus is preaching and teaching. He says, we human beings are called to go from speech back to silence. So retrace our steps. And he talks about five kinds of silence. Uh, they're pretty basic, but I'll explain each one. First of all, the silence of the tongue. Uh, that's when you avoid all evil speech. Uh, 
Not only that, I'd say, I'd, I'd say that's also when you avoid all gossip, uh, all talking trash, to use a uh, <laughs> contemporary la language. Uh, just cheap talk, you know, noise. Uh, secondly, the silence of the body. And what he meant by that is our senses. In other words, we we'll get to a point where we're not thinking about what we're going to eat next and uh, uh, we're not thinking about, you know, uh, what we're going to watch on TV and so forth. Uh, so silence of the body. Silence of the soul. That's where the soul no longer has evil thoughts or, uh, as, as we said before, uh, uh, you know, things that fill ourselves with things that can be destructive to us. Then the silence of the intellect. And there is where you finally quiet your mind from, uh, you know, uh, getting all worked up about uh, things going on in politics or whatever, uh, or, uh, uh, you know, uh, who's right and who's wrong and so forth. Uh, you clear your, your intellect of all these issues. And finally, the silence of the spirit. Now, with the silence of the spirit, uh, what is very interesting, here is where you even remove what uh, grace is giving you in your mind. In other words, that point in your mind where you're really having a very exalted prayer. But for him, you reach a point where your mind shuts down and God takes over. And so uh, this is the point where now, as he puts it, you're being stirred uh, uh, by uh, God himself, he calls it being, the existent one. Uh, so, uh, so now you're, you're, nothing else is going on. Your mind is unable to function. No thinking, no authority, no words, no, uh, so you're really into a mystical experience. So these are the, uh, uh, what he means by silent prayer. Now, if you and I get to that level, but I, one of the spiritual writers pointed out that this perfect level happens to one in 10,000 people. <laughs> uh, but if you get to that level, then there are experiences that you would never even dream of. So for example, one of the things they talk about is divine light. That, uh, that if you reach that high level then you experience a light that is not really normal light at all. Uh, so a divine illumination, uh, something that is from God himself. So on, on that sheet you got, uh, I have a quotation here, the first one, <coughs> from someone named John Saba. Saba in Syriac means the elder, means the elder of Dalyata, which I think is in uh, northern Iraq. And he was in the 8th century. So here's what he says. When it comes to prayer, it sees, he's talking about the soul. When it comes to prayer, it sees its own glory. And upon the soul there dawns the beauty of its nature. And it sees itself as it really is. And sees the divine light dawning in it and changing it into his likeness while the lightness of its own nature is removed from its sight. And it sees itself as the lightness of God, being united with the light without lightness, which is the light of the Trinity, shining forth in the soul itself. It becomes immersed in the waves of its beauty and remains in wonderment for a long period. So that's pretty powerful. <coughs> and if any of you has one of these experiences, please tell me so that I can uh, use them in my next lecture. Uh, <coughs> but, uh, but notice the consistency here, that it all goes back to our soul being in the image and likeness of God. They also talk in terms of uh, reaching a state of unknowing. Uh, there's a famous work that came out in the Western world some centuries ago called The Cloud of Unknowing. And uh, it actually goes back to uh, a writer uh, who's known as Pseudo Dionysius, <coughs> the Areopagite, back in the, around, the, again, the year 500. <coughs> and he uses the word unknowing. But what he meant by that 
is not ignorance. Uh, it's, ignorance is where somebody doesn't want to know. What he's talking here about unknowing is you're at a point where your mind can't handle it. It's just too beyond. Uh, and so uh, you get to a point where there is another knowledge, but you can only deal with it in a, in a finite, finite way. And so, again, uh, this whole idea of uh, a region of unknowing. Uh, they talk in terms of a divine wisdom. They talk in terms of a sense of wonder. They even talk about intoxication. Uh, they really do a lot about that. Uh, and so you're at a point, again, where you're completely out of your depth. Uh, and so uh, you, you reach that level. Uh, finally, uh, they talk in terms of a union with the divine. And John Saba, I don't have the quote here for you, uh, but he compares it to uh, the making of, uh, of, of iron. Uh, I mean, it's actually the making of steel. Uh, I remember uh, when I was a young boy growing up in Youngstown, Ohio, uh, he, uh, they took us, uh, the, the third largest steel company in the United States was in Youngstown, Ohio, Youngstown Sheet and Tube. And they took us on a day trip to the steel mill and down to the blast furnace. And there's where you saw the, the iron coming in blast furnace, and you get to a point where what you see is just fire. Uh, and you just see the fire going uh, through, and then it, it, it cools off into a, a steel ingot. So uh, John Saba uh, has a quotation about that, and I can read it to you. I didn't put it on your list. <clears throat> Talking about what happens to the soul uh, with God. He says, consider the fire that unites with the iron in the furnace. The appearance of the iron is not perceived there anymore because it now has the likeness of the fire through its union. You do not see two images, but one. The power of discriminating the natures has been removed and that they have become the likeness of the supreme nature. The sons of God see themselves in the likeness of their father. So uh, this is how he described it. Finally, uh, again, this has been just an overview. Uh, I have this other quotation that I have here, uh, and it kind of summarizes everything I've been trying to say. And what I like about this quotation is uh, the author, whose name is Philoxenus, uh, is talking about how God is trying to relate to us. And it's in the form of a prayer. And so, it's the other one on your sheet there. Who is the human being who could consider God by a vigilant thought and observe his majesty and examine his hiddenness and see with his mind's eye? And here's how he describes God. That serene and holy nature that has no need of anything, whose place is high and his dwelling is elevated, in whom all riches and blessings and treasures are gathered which is entirely light and life and delight. Again, about God. Who is the one who pardons and the merciful one and good, who is benevolent, compassionate, and full of love, who is becoming and desirable and beautiful, who makes petition and asks and urges every person to live? Notice that. God is asking us to live. Who is anxious for our lives and seeks our discoveries, and is comforted with our comforts more than we. Comforted with our comforts. Who is constantly making petition to us to take from his wealth and plunder his treasury and become rich from his treasures and not be poor. Who does not rejoice in his life but in our lives. Who because our poverty was not sufficient to ascend to his wealth he brought down his wealth to our poverty, who because he saw that we did not wish to become rich, he made himself poor in order to enrich us, who makes the soul that senses him taste and 
the sweetness of the Spirit, whose grace is long and whose justice is brief, ready for forgiveness and slow for refutation. He has created our, nat our, our nature as beloved sons who are sought by him and is not fulfilled until he has given himself to us in his love. So uh, to me, that's just powerful uh, because I, I think I started all of this by saying that uh, the real point of the Syriac writers is to start off with the fact that God is unconditioned love. And if God is unconditioned love, what are the ramifications? And so uh, I think this is what the whole story is of the spiritual life. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Father.